Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery where today we're going to be talking about the mysterious sweating sickness that plagued Tudor England, also occasionally known specifically as the English sweating sickness. To this day nobody knows what caused it or what it was. I'm so excited to get into this video because it encompasses all of my favourite things, it's a historical medical mystery with lots of different theories to explore. This particular sweating sickness caused five epidemics in England between 1485 and 1551, with mortality rates between 30% and 50%. That's high. You would get sick and die within just 24 hours, and then as suddenly as it appeared, the sweating sickness disappeared, never to be experienced again. But the butterfly effect that this disease had on the world has probably affected each and every one of us. And of course, a huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creative and curious people. With Skillshare, you can explore new interests, develop existing interests, and get lost in your creativity. One of my absolute favourite hobbies at the moment is to just browse Skillshare and see what new thing I can learn about that day, whether that's cooking or yoga, or how to make my YouTube videos better, I can always find something that's going to take my fancy. And this month I want to recommend a fantastic class by Halise Narvez called Video for Instagram, tell an engaging story in less than a minute. Since I steered my YouTube away from lifestyle content and started focusing purely on the educational aspect, I've been wanting to figure out how to share more of my life within my boundaries on Instagram as some people say they miss that kind of more personal content. But I'm the kind of gal who loves long form content, most of my videos are around half an hour long, I struggle to be succinct, so short snappy Instagram videos and reels are something completely out of my comfort zone. In this class, Lise works through the technique of storytelling as well as the technical aspect of it all, how to use different filming and editing techniques to get your narrative across if your words can't. This class is great if you're a complete beginner or if you're a seasoned creator, just looking for a burst of inspiration, or somewhere in the middle, just like me. Creative challenges and productivity classes can be a great way to help you structure your time and set up achievable goals. Whether you're wanting to just fend off boredom or focus on self-care through creativity, learn how to use your skills for social good, or just become part of a creative and encouraging community, Skillshare is the best place for you. Whatever you're interested in learning about, I can almost guarantee there's a class waiting for you on Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description to sign up to Skillshare will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, and then after that, it's only around $10 or about £7 a month. So to begin with this story, we need a little bit of historical context here, but I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. We start in 1485 and the War of the Roses is finally nearing its end. This was a civil war fought for the throne of England, each house represented by a different coloured rose, hence the War of the Roses. In the end, Henry Tudor, better known as Henry VII, defeated King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth, thus beginning the Tudor reign. It's speculated that the sweating sickness may have even contributed to Henry's win, when Lord Stanley, who contributed about 30% of Richard III's army, had to pull out of battle because his army suffered from the sweat. Although he did change sides to the Tudors the last minute, and this may be more of a contribution towards their win than apparent sickness that we don't even know for sure actually happened, it might have just been an excuse. But Henry VII arrived in London shortly after his win, and it was there just three weeks later that the sweating sickness made what was thought to be his first proper appearance in London in September 1485. Some think that it may have been Henry's army coming back across the Channel from France that may have brought the sweating sickness to Britain, but there's no record of it being on mainland Europe at this time, so probably not. But there's also speculation that it may have appeared in Britain two years earlier, in 1483, due to a mention by Erasmus, and then it reappeared again two years later in 85. Or according to the York Civic Records, maybe even first made an appearance in the northeast area of England in June 1485, three months before it appeared in London in the September. So long story short, we're not entirely sure when the sweating sickness first appeared in Britain. Probably around 1485 though. 
This first epidemic burned quickly around England for just six weeks, killing about 15,000 people before disappearing. There would then be four further epidemics before disappearing forever, hopefully. Just like the 1485 epidemic, the next four would all take place in the summer months of 1508, 1517, 1528 and 1551. In 1525, the population of England would have been only a little over 2 million people. To put it into perspective, the population of England today is just over 55 million and London alone houses almost 9 million people. So a single epidemic wiping out 15,000 of these people would have been pretty bad. And this did pretty much only affect England. There were very few cases found over the borders in Scotland and Wales. It did travel to mainland Europe at some point in the 16th century, most notably to Hamburg, where a few thousand people died in just a few weeks, and then from there it spread across Eastern Europe. But in each place in Europe, it would just burn for a couple of weeks before dying out, and then after that, it's never seen again on mainland Europe. But it would appear again many times in England, and England alone. Around these times, of course, there were a number of epidemics rife in Britain. There was the plague and typhus, even malaria. But this so-called sweating sickness, or Pseudo Anglicus as it was known back then, was different from the rest and people knew it. This sickness would come on suddenly and violently. It would start with a sense of apprehension or anxiety, followed quickly by intense sweating, followed by exhaustion and fatigue. Those were kind of the main symptoms you'd find in pretty much everyone with the illness. But there were also myriad other symptoms, including rheumatic pain, fever, abdominal pain, tachycardia, intense thirst, flushing, vomiting, bleeding, and diarrhea. And as well as all of this, you could also get neurological symptoms, including pins and needles on the lower end of the spectrum, and mental status changes, such as becoming overly talkative and getting delirium. Occasionally, you'd get multiple organ failure, which more often than not, would lead to death. There are very few first-hand accounts of what sweating sickness was actually like. Most of what we know today comes from an account from the final epidemic in 1551, in a book published by a physician of the time called John Caius. Caius writes in the final stage, sufferers would experience a marvellous heaviness and a desire to sleep. After 24 hours, you'd either be dead or on your way to recovery. If you survived past 24 hours, you'd suffer anywhere from 3 to 14 days, but you probably would survive. And like I said, it had a fairly high mortality rate, anything up to 50%, maybe even more than that. It was for these reasons and many more that Caius asserted that the sweating sickness was crueler than even the bubonic plague and claimed that the sweating sickness immediately killed some in opening their windows, some in playing with children in their street doors, some in one hour, many in two, it destroyed. As it found them, so it took them, some in sleep, some in wake, some in mirth, some in care, some fasting and some full, some busy and some idle. And in one house, sometime three, sometime five, sometime more, sometime all. This was said to be the easiest disease to die of. You'd get a bit anxious, you'd get pain, then you'd begin to sweat, and then you were dead before you could even call a doctor. Whilst Caius never noted any lesions on the skin of victims, another physician called Thomas Forestier did note black spots on some afflicted people. And whilst most sicknesses around this time would ravage the lower classes, the sweating sickness, for whatever reason, really seemed to affect the rich. It swept through the wealthy, the most upper classes of households, and in the process, many royals contracted it. It's not entirely known why the rich were so disproportionately affected by this, and we'll delve more into this in the theories towards the end of the video, but it could simply be that they weren't as affected by other major epidemics that have broken out in recent years. Epidemics that tended to spread through the poor communities due to overcrowding. Is it possible that the rich people's immune systems just weren't strong enough to fight this virus after living relatively healthy lives until then? Or at least as healthy as you could be in Tudor England anyway? The sweating sickness would also tend to disproportionately affect men, although women could catch it, and the middle aged were much more susceptible. Older people and children were usually spared. 
Although it is worth noting, there's very little documentation around this disease. Some historians do suspect that it might not have only affected the rich, it might have affected everyone. But it was only documented when it affected the rich, particularly the rich middle-aged men, the important people in Tudor society. However, again, it is also reported that a lot of the lower classes referred to the sickness as stop gallant or stop gallant, which was a sarcastic name because of how it only tended to affect the rich. There are so many different sides to the coin when you're looking at history. There's different historians coming to all these different conclusions. And unless there's five star documentation kept of whatever was going on, there's no way for us to know centuries later exactly what life was like back then. History is part fact and part a lot of educated guesses, especially when you're looking at medieval times. The most notable monarch of the Tudor period was, of course, Henry VIII, Henry VII's son. And nobody was as scared of the sweating sickness as Henry VIII. The term hypochondriac actually springs to mind, in which case, same. He would order his royal physicians to examine him thoroughly on a pretty much daily basis, and he had a medicine cabinet bursting at the seams. In contradiction to the tough king he was often thought to be, it was actually said that Henry VIII was very timid and in a constant state of worry. Also same. But he actually had very good reason to be scared of this disease. In April 1502, when Henry was just 10 years old, his older brother Arthur died just aged 15. This would change the course of Henry's life forever, because now with Arthur gone, Henry would be king. And actually, this wouldn't just change Henry's life forever, it would change the course of England forever, and probably on the back of that, a lot of the world forever, because, you know, colonialism. Henry VIII would shape England with his creation of the Church of England and his many wives. But why is this relevant to this video, you may ask? Well, it's thought that Arthur may have been a victim of the sweating sickness, although again, some historians debate this and think it may have been a case of TB. For the sake of this video though, we're going to say it was sweating sickness. Just the year before his death, Arthur had married Catherine of Aragon, and it's even thought that Catherine may have also come down with the illness as she was unwell around the same time as Arthur. But as we know, men were much more affected by the sweat. Catherine would survive, but Arthur would die. If it was the sweating sickness that killed off Arthur here, imagine the butterfly effect that this one disease, this unknown disease, has inadvertently had on every single one of our lives. If the sweating sickness hadn't killed off Arthur, Henry VIII would never have been king, we wouldn't have the Church of England. Imagine the domino effect that this has had. In 2002, they actually exhumed Arthur's body from Worcester Cathedral to see if they could find any further clues as to what killed him, and if it was the sweating sickness, to see if they could find any clues about that, but they didn't find anything. Henry VIII would spend his entire life in rural paranoid about catching sweating sickness. He ruled throughout the epidemics of 1508, 1517 and 1528. As we all know, Henry would end up marrying Catherine of Aragon, his brother's widow. Together they would give birth to Mary, but after Henry realised that Catherine wouldn't give him a son, he fell in love with Anne Boleyn. He asked the Pope for a divorce and the Pope said no, therefore he broke with Rome and created the Church of England, then himself the head of it. He would end up marrying Anne in 1533, but Henry had his eye on Anne for years before they ended up marrying. As soon as he heard about the outbreak of 1528, Henry ordered that court be broken up and he fled London as quickly as he could. I mean, most rich people would do this whenever they heard of whatever the latest epidemic was. He would usually go and stay at Hampton Court, but he didn't think this was far enough from London when it came to the sweat, so he actually went as far away from London as he possibly could. But then Henry heard that Anne, the woman he intended to one day marry, had come down with the sweating sickness and was sick at Heber Castle. Henry, very paranoid about getting the sickness himself, didn't go and see her, but dispatched his second best physician to go and help, William Bartz, sending him along with a love letter. His second best doctor, that is true love in Tudor times. Anne, as we know, survived the sickness along with her brother and father, and she would go on to marry Henry, only for him to end up ordering her beheading after she was convicted of adultery and treason. 
might have been better to just die of the sweating sickness. Many close members of Henry's court would come down with the sickness around 1528, including his chief advisor, Thomas Wolsey. I would say it was pure luck that Henry never got ill, but that's probably not actually the case. He was way ahead of his time and did the 16th century version of self-isolation as soon as he heard any whisper of illness. I mean, think how scared humanity is of COVID-19 now when we have a solid scientific understanding of how disease works and how we can avoid it as best we can. Imagine this same panic with no scientific understanding whatsoever, not knowing how and why diseases spread. That was the situation for Tudor England. They didn't know why people got sick. They just knew people did get sick and it was bad. The last epidemic happened after Henry died in 1551 and it saw that this was a much less fatal branch of the disease. It didn't quite seem to have the same effect on the population that it had before, and it saw that the virus had just mutated over the years into something less scary. This final outbreak is said to have begun in Shrewsbury around April of that year, where it killed a thousand people before spreading further afield. Yes, this was a less deadly variant killing a thousand people. It was bad. Although we don't know in total how many people died of the sweating sickness, it's likely that it would have been in the hundreds of thousands. By October of that year, it had all died out and it was never to be seen again. Maybe. I say maybe because an illness called the Bacardi Sweat would appear in the northern province of Bacardi in France in 1718. Between then and 1874, 194 different epidemics of the Bacardi Sweat were recorded, most of which were small and confined to the northwest area of France. Interestingly, where this Picardy sweat came from in France is also where a lot of the soldiers travelled back to England from after the War of the Roses. And as you can probably guess by the name, the Picardy sweat, it had a lot of similarities to the sweating sickness, but not quite enough similarities to say for certain that it was the same. The Picardy sweat was said to be less fatal than the sweating sickness, with only around a 20% fatality rate, although this does vary. In some of the Picardy epidemics, there were no deaths with very mild symptoms, other had fatality rates of 30 or 40%. There was even an epidemic as late as 1906 in Charente that wiped out whole families in just a few days. With Picardy, if you didn't die within 48 hours, you'll likely survive, compared to the 24 hours of sweating sickness. You would get a tight chest and feelings of suffocation and great distress your lungs, heart and cardiovascular system would be unaffected. You'd have a curious sensation in the limbs and joints like air was moving inside. If you're going to be one of the ones that die of Picardy, you would get delirium and collapse, death occurring within just a few hours of its onset of symptoms. But if you made it past the 48 hour mark, you would get one hell of a rash that would start in the neck and the trunk and spread out across most of the body, but it would always stop at the wrist, strangely, it never went on the hands. This rash was not a feature of the English sweating sickness, but both diseases did feature intense sweating. Whilst the sweating sickness appeared most in urban, heavily populated areas, the Bacardi swear would appear most in rural areas and rarely touch the cities. All of which I suppose brings us nicely to the theory section of this video. There have been so many theories as to what exactly this sickness was. Is it something that we experience in everyday life now? Is it something completely extinct? What caused it? Some think it was a divine intervention from God who was angry at Tudor rule, but probably not. We're going to be looking at scientific theories here rather than anything theological. Now these are all things which we speculated in the past and or speculated now. First we'll blast through some of the more easily discounted theories. It wasn't typhus because of the speed of the disease. Typhus is more of a slow burner, whereas sweating sickness will kill you within a day as we've covered. You also don't typically get sweating with typhus. It wasn't influenza because you generally wouldn't get any respiratory symptoms. It wasn't the plague because none of the symptoms matched up. But something which has been recently theorised is anthrax, which was suggested by microbiologist Edward McSweegan after the 2001 anthrax attacks across the USA. 
it had never really been thought of as a possibility before this point because documented cases of inhalation anthrax were very rare and sweating wasn't a noted symptom of the more common forms of anthrax, cutaneous and gastrointestinal. But it was a symptom when it was inhaled, along with exhaustion and sudden onset. But anthrax is much more deadly than even the sweating sickness was, as even with treatment the mortality rate is 45%. But anthrax could explain the mysterious black spots that only some victims had, as noted by Forestier. Cutaneous anthrax, which is when anthrax gets into the skin through a cut or a wound, can cause skin lesions. Anthrax can be contracted through anthrax spores in wool, which might be the likely option here, although even McSweegan has admitted that inhalation anthrax would have been rare before industrialised wool production. This theory, as with all the others, has its holes, but honestly it's not one that I want to write off completely. We could potentially get some answers here by digging up victims of the sweating sickness and testing their bodies for anthrax spores, but even then it's not 100%. These bodies are 500 years old, so who knows how well they'd be preserved. Next, let's explore the theory of ergotism. If you watched another one of my historical mystery medical videos on the dancing plague, then you may recall this. If you didn't, then ergotism is the effect of long-time ergot poisoning, which is a type of fungus that mainly infects rye. The symptoms of this include convulsions, painful seizures and spasms, as well as mania and psychosis, headaches, nausea, vomiting. You'll notice a lack of sweating in that list though. All in all, this theory really isn't that strong, mostly because of the fact that at the time, rye wasn't commonly used in England, it was more common on mainland Europe and it wouldn't have really been something that people consumed here on a daily or even weekly basis. So it probably wasn't ergotism. And then there's also botulism, a type of poisoning caused by exposure to a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. I'm going to put it here. These bacteria manufacture a chemical poison, a toxin, which is known as botulinum, which in a human interferes with muscle function in many areas of the body, leading to paralysis of groups of muscles. It's pretty life-threatening as it can affect the diaphragm and therefore your breathing. You can be exposed to this bacteria by eating contaminated goods. It exists in dirt and dust as spores, but generally isn't activated until it's moved to a low oxygen environment, such as an enclosed jar or can. In the USA, about 100 people become ill with botulism every year, so it's rare, but it's not impossible. But of course, Tudor England wouldn't have had access to canned goods, so how was this theory relevant here? It was actually found in Germany around this time, and fish and sausages were blamed for the outbreaks. But then again, due to geography, it seems unlikely that the cause could have been the same in England. So that's another theory that a lot of people strike off the list, but it's a theory. Another common theory is that of dengue fever, a mosquito-borne virus that causes severe flu-like illness, including some pretty profuse sweating. Now you're probably thinking, mosquito-borne illnesses in the UK? Really? Although we do have native mosquito species here, they're generally not disease-carrying. But a lot can change in 500 years. The sweating sickness actually occurred only in summers, at the beginning of a 300-year period of cooling across Europe. The weather would have fluctuated a lot back then, and summers likely would have been significantly warmer than they are now, and they would have followed a long period of rainfall and extensive flooding. Which could also explain why only England was really affected. The higher, colder and drier parts of Britain, such as Wales and Scotland, would have been less infected with mosquitoes who would have thrived in this wet environment. I mean, there's even evidence that malaria was once indigenous to the UK, and therefore other mosquito-borne illnesses easily could have been around. In most cases, dengue tends to be mild, but it can progress to something much more severe. Early detection now means a fatality rate is below 1%, but could this have been the case in the 1500s? Could it have been a lot more deadly? Could it have all just been caused by a more severe strain of dengue that doesn't really exist anymore? Relapsing fever is a disease spread by ticks and lice, which of course were very common in Tudor England. 
Relapsing fever has a short incubation period and its onset is sudden and severe, just like sweating sickness. But sweating is not a feature and the jaundice associated with relapsing fever is not a feature of the sweat. There is also usually a pretty obvious black spot or scab which appears at the point of the infected tick bite. And as we know, Forestier noted a black spot on some victims of the disease, but Chaos did not. Without treatment, relapsing fever has a 30 to 70% mortality rate. Again, we've got some similarities here, but probably not enough. And I've saved the best theory for last, or at least the theory which is thought to be closest to the truth in current day. And that's that the sweating sickness was a form of hantavirus. Back in May 1993, there was an outbreak of an unexplained pulmonary illness in the Four Corners in the USA, which is an area shared by Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado and Utah. A young Navajo man, physically fit, was rushed into hospital after suffering from shortness of breath and he died very soon after. They soon discovered that his fiancée had died only a few days before after showing very similar symptoms. So an investigation was launched in New Mexico and authorities found they couldn't identify the death as being caused by any known disease. After much testing, they were able to link this disease to a previously unknown type of hantavirus. Hantaviruses are transmitted to people by rodents, mice and rats. So basically these medical professionals spent that entire summer in the Four Corners region trying to trap every type of rodent they could. And they found that the deer mouse was a host of this particular hantavirus that they had found in these humans. About 30% of the deer mice captured had hantavirus. This virus was eventually named the Muerto Canyon virus, which was later changed to the Sin Nombre virus. It was actually incredibly impressive how fast they were able to isolate this virus and get some answers. Out of 23 victims in the Four Corners outbreak who got hantavirus, 10 of them died. They were able to discover and isolate this virus in a matter of months. It was incredible. The earliest description of hantaviruses date back to China in 900 AD and they popped up all throughout history since then, all spread by rodents. Hantaviruses are known to be accompanied by profuse sweating and the incubation time of sweating sickness was thought to be around 44 days if you follow the timeline of the soldiers coming back after the War of the Roses, which also falls in line with the incubation period of hantavirus. Hantavirus also has about a 38% fatality rate, very similar to that of sweating sickness. You probably assume that you get hantavirus from a bite or a rodent, but actually that's not the case because as you can imagine, rodents don't actually bite humans all that often. You get the hantavirus by inhaling aerosolized rodent urine or feces. There's only one recorded outbreak in which it was transmitted person to person. You don't get hantavirus just by being in the vicinity of somebody with hantavirus. You get it by breathing in rat poop. But this actually makes a lot of sense as to why this disease seemed to disproportionately affect the upper classes. Every middle to upper class household in Tudor England had a housekeeper made to take care of the house and make sure that it remains clean. As soon as any rodent droppings were found, they were quickly swept away. But this may have been their downfall. Sweeping up the droppings would release the hantavirus loaded dust into the air for all the people to breathe in. The poorer communities may have actually been saved by a lack of hygiene. If rat droppings were found, they were generally left alone. And poor people would generally have spent more time out in the open because the houses weren't anything special. Actually, the houses were just rooms with a lot of people shoved inside. Rich people actually spent a lot more time inside their houses, just breathing in the rat poop dust in the air. And then as the climate began to change towards the end of the century, it started to get colder. And this led to a subtle change in the environment, which made the rats less habitable for hantavirus. I keep saying rats, it could have been mice or any other rodents, but rats. Although this theory definitely does still have its holes, it makes the most sense of what we have and a lot of modern day epidemiologists do believe that the sweating sickness was a form of hantavirus, just a very strong form of hantavirus that affected thousands of people. It could have been something as simple as a rat coming over on the ships from mainland Europe 
and the virus mutating into the sweating sickness, maybe it was the same as Picardi sweat, but the strains mutated differently. Maybe, we don't know. Honestly, we'll probably never know the true cause of sweating sickness unless one day it happens to reappear, but I really hope it doesn't because I, for one, am all pandemic out. Perhaps this one is better left a mystery with some educated guesses. I know this video is a bit different from my usual kind of midweek mystery, but sometimes it's nice to take a step back from true crime and all the darkness and just focus on a different type of mystery. I really enjoy occasionally doing something like this. So I hope you guys don't mind and enjoy watching them. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys. Oh, and let me know if there are any other medical mysteries you'd like to see me cover. I'm always looking for new medical mysteries.